Uh, Tonight we're going to be in Acts chapter 15. Uh, We're going to look at Paul's second missionary journey. Now I'm going to attempt to do something tonight that might be a bit impossible. But I'm going to cover that whole journey. I'm going to highlight a few things. But there are, there's a passage in there. There's, there's a passage of Scripture we're really, we will really focus on. And so, I mean, we'll, we'll, cover, we'll cover some places. But there's, there's a message here I want to share with you that's in the context of this journey. Now, you know when you go on a trip, I mean, you get all ready and you prepare. Like, you know, you go vacationing or something. Uh, you, you go on this long journey. Well, Paul and his sidekick Barnabas had been on this, the first journey. They went from Antioch, and they went all around and went this shorter loop, and they came back to Antioch. And then they had this Jerusalem council. They had, this, this, they had to clarify what the gospel was because they had, they had some issues. And they finally went, they went down to Jerusalem, clarified that, came back. And now you have uh, their... Uh, where, where Paul actually is sitting there, and he and Barnabas are sitting there, and, and they're just looking at each other. And there, chapter 15, verse 36, I'm going to read that for you. I don't know if I've made that. Uh, it's not very big. <laughs> not very big at all. But I'll go ahead and uh, I will improve that for tomorrow. <laughs> you guys are my guinea pigs. <laughs> but I'll go ahead and read that out of the Bible for you, and, uh, and then I'll explain it to you. Okay? All right. Verse 36, And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with him John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so that they separated from each other, Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Okay, so Paul and Barnabas have this discussion. They say, hey, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's go back. Let's retrace our steps. And let's go strengthen those churches. Let's see how they're doing. Okay, so Paul and Barnabas get ready to go. And then Barnabas says, well, I want to, hey, let me bring along Mark. Well, Mark... Uh, abandoned them on the last trip. And Paul said, no, 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 no. He's a quitter. I'm not bringing quitters on. You're not going with me. And so they start having this argument. They start having this, this argument, Barnabas and Paul. And, uh, you know, what this tells us, that even in the early church, they had arguments and disagreements, right? I mean, they weren't perfect. So they had this argument and disagreement. But what happened was, out of this, you end up having two mission teams from this, right? Um, you know, we, also, we often talk about church splits. It's unfortunate that sometimes the only way they plant churches is through church splits. <laughs> it's not pleasant. It's not good. But sometimes you have churches that are ready to give birth to a new church. And instead of planting a new church, they, they just plant. So we have churches all across the state of Illinois that would not be there if it hadn't been for a church split. Did God, did God, uh, did God do some, have something to do with that? I don't know. But here we have a sharp division, and you have two mission teams instead of one. So I, that was a plus. And then later on, we do know that Paul and Mark, they do make up. I mean, Mark, Paul says of Mark, he's, he's, he's a good guy. He's, in fact, Mark's very good because he wrote the book of Mark in the Bible. So pretty, pretty good, pretty good credential there. Okay, so, so they do get along, but we do know that even in the early church, we want to ideal, we want to so idealize the early church and make it look like they were perfect, but we find here, no, they weren't perfect. They're like us. They're human. They're, and you have Paul, the super Christian, and Barnabas, the super Christian, and they both have an argument, and they can't, get, they can't agree, and they finally they split ways. And so you have uh, Barnabas takes Mark, he goes to Cilicia, Cyprus, not Cilicia. They go to Cyprus. This is familiar territory. Mark evidently is not ready to go beyond the beyond, but they go back and they visit those churches there. And then uh, Paul takes Silas. Silas, he's a prophet. He's a preacher and teacher. And he's a proven proven and doing ministry. 
So Paul said, I'll take him with me, and he will, we'll go, and we'll, we'll go these, uh, this other way. And that's what happens, okay? So in this second, second missionary journey, Paul is going with a different partner. So let's go. Then they go. Okay, here's the map. Show you the map. And we'll come back to this. I hope you can see that. I hope it's not too confusing for you. You see over there Syria, all the way on your, your right side. You have Syria, and you have right over there in that area, that's where they start out from, is Antioch. Okay? And they will, they will head out. They go north, and they go through. You see Cilicia is the purple thing. Then you go up the green, the green area. See the green? That's Galatia. That's the area where Paul and Barnabas, Derbe, Lystra, and all those areas, that's where they planted those churches, and this is where Paul wants to go visit, in that area of Galatia. He wants to check up on them. But Paul's going to go through Tarsus, his own home in Cilicia, and he goes on up to, into Galatia. Okay? So that's the plan. They're going to go visit and check up on those people. Okay? But something happens as they go up, we find out they get stuck in a place called Troas, okay? I'll go ahead and read that for you, and, uh, because I know you can't see that. So Acts 16, verse 6 through 10, he says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul at night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God has called us to preach the gospel to them. Now it's interesting. Go back to that, that other slide where I want to show something. You see, the, you see the, the red continent there, Asia? It's awfully small, isn't it, compared to the Asia we call today. That's what Asia was like back then. I mean, that's what, that was the region there. Uh, that's what they called Asia. So Paul went through that area. You see the red line? And what it says there is the Holy Spirit would not allow Paul and Silas, as they went through there, they, he did not allow them. He forbid them to preach the gospel there. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, later we know that Asia gets the gospel preached there. God does that later. But now is not the time. God has something on the agenda now for them to go to. Okay? But Asia's not yet ready. And so God has them, and they stop there at Troas. It's on the very edge. You probably can't see it very well, but they're stuck there. And they say, well, okay, oh God, uh, you don't want us to preach here. So what do you want us to do? So they're stuck there for a little while, and they're praying about it. And while they're praying about it, Paul gets a dream. He sits there, and he dreams, and he has a dream of this man coming to him. It's Macedonian, and Macedonia, you see the orange one up up your upper left? That's Macedonia. And a guy from Macedonia appears to Paul and says, Come over and help us. We need the gospel preached to us. Come over and help us. And when Paul woke up from the vision, he concluded that God was calling him to go over there. So, so it's interesting. What, what we see is, and what I want you to think about for a moment, is Paul and Barnabas, they really didn't pray about going back to Galatia, did they? They just decided, well, let's go back and visit Galatia. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we just, go, we just know we just, something's on our heart to do. God puts it on our heart. We, we want to do something, and we go and do it. And you know what? As we're doing it, then God gives the direction while we're doing it. Okay? And that happens a lot of times. You know, but, but we, we, we follow the, compa- the compelling, the compulsion of our heart. Our heart says, I want you to love these people. I want you to care about these people. And as you're following the love that's in your heart, as you're following your heart, then God begins to give you direction as you're stepping and this is what we see. As they're going, God is giving direction. So they knew, I don't know how they knew, they knew they were not to preach in Asia, and they were stuck there in Troas, and then in that moment, God gave them the direction, go over to Macedonia, okay? So they go to Macedonia, 
And on this, uh, on this mission trip, the first place they actually go to is Philippi. You can see over there on that map, the, the red line kind of goes over there to Macedonia, a place called Philippi. I think you might need to do two slides there, I think, uh, um, Lori. Yeah, right there. And while they're at Philippi, I can go into the, all the details. That's something you might want to read. But while they're at Philippi, these are the things that they encounter there in that city. Okay? They go there, and they go to a place, a, a place of prayer. Now, this isn't a Jewish synagogue. This is just some place of prayer where people pray. It could be pagans. I don't know what kind of place this is. I mean, it doesn't really clarify. It's just a place of prayer. So people are going down to pray to this place. And a woman named Lydia was there. She was a caller of, she was a seller of purple. And when you sold purple garments, that was a royal, you were selling, it was a very rich and lavish garment. You were selling it to very wealthy, often royalty is what you were doing it for, because purple was the, uh, was the, so he went there and as they were at this place of prayer, he's talked to Lydia, and Lydia was actually his first convert to Christ here in Philippi. She believed the gospel, she was baptized, and she told them, she said, if, if, it's, if it pleases you, come over to my house, you guys can stay there and set up shop, and just, just operate from here. So then the second thing you have happen at Philippi is a demon, there was a demon-possessed slave girl. Now this is interesting, because Paul's walking through the streets, he's getting ready, to, he's preaching, to, talking to people the gospel, and there's this girl, this slave girl, that was used by um, uh, a, an occult-type person, was used to read people's fortunes and all that kind of stuff. She was demon-possessed. Now, this demon-possessed girl sees Paul and Barnabas, or not Paul, Paul and Silas. She sees Paul, and she walks up to him. These are the prophets of the Most High God. And he, they're walking along. There's this woman. She's, these are the prophets of the Most High God. These are the prophets of the Most High God. And she it says there, she does this for several days. She does this for several days. And it isn't until after Paul gets annoyed, okay? Yeah. All right, come out of her. He, he, he rebukes this, he rebukes the spirit. In Jesus' name, I command you, come out of her. And the spirit leaves her. Well, she can't do her fortune telling anymore. She can't do all that stuff anymore, Okay. And so, because she can't do that, her, her master has lost his way of making money. And so he gets really mad and upset. He, throw, he gets, uh, gets Paul arrested, beaten, and thrown in jail for it. Okay? Now, I, I want to stop just for a moment before I go any further. Now, some people, that would be the first thing they would do, wouldn't it? Walk into town and cast out all the demons first. <laughs> but Paul, that wasn't the first thing he did. He went around and preached, he was preaching the gospel, and it wasn't until the woman was bothering him until he actually cast the demon out. And there's some people who are so quick to cast demons out, look for demons to cast them out. But Paul wasn't looking for them. But he does, he casts the demon out. He's arrested, he's beaten and thrown in jail. And while he's in jail, there's a Philippian jailer, and him and Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas actually, they're, they're in the stocks, and at midnight, they start singing into God. They sing hymns, and they start praising God at night at midnight. They start singing kind of crazy. And all the guys, they listen, and they think, well, this is really weird. And all of a sudden, the jail, there's an earthquake in the jail. It breaks open, and then uh, the jailer walks in, sees all the bars and the the, the gate's unlocked, and he's going to kill himself. And Paul says, don't kill yourself, we're still here. And so Paul shares the gospel with the jailer. The jailer believes the gospel and comes to faith in Christ. The jailer takes him home, takes him to his house that night, washes Paul's wounds because he's beaten, and then Paul baptizes the jailer in his old household. Okay? So that's quite something. The next day... Uh, the magistrates, oh, there's nothing wrong. Paul did nothing wrong. They, threw, you know, they had him in jail, and they said, well, you can release him. They send some, some jailer to release him, and Paul says, no, 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 no. This isn't going to happen. This, I'm a Roman citizen. Get them to release us themselves. <laughs> and so, anyway, they finally release them, and they leave Philippi. So that's what happens to Philippi. Then they move on to Thessalonica. 
Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica, this is his custom. He usually goes to the synagogue, and he was in Thessalonica for three weeks. So he goes there, reasons with the Jews and Gentiles about Jesus. And so after a while, there's Jews that, don't want, that reject what he says, and they, they uh, create a riot, a revolt against Paul and Silas. And so they were taken to the city authorities, along with Jason, one of the new believers. And then they let them go after Jason, he pays money for security. I don't know if it's bail or something. But he was only there for three weeks, and they got believers there at Thessalonica. And we have the books of Thessalonians uh, written after that, too. So he goes from Thessalonica, and he moves on to, what's the next place? Berea. And he's there at a... He's there in Berea a short while, too. In Berea. Now, there's something interesting. He does the same thing. He goes to the Jewish synagogue. But the Bereans, it says, they were noble because they searched the Scriptures daily. When Paul was sharing about Jesus being the Christ that was prophesied, the Bereans actually had their, their Scriptures out, and they were searching to see whether he was, he was on the mark or not. So they were called noble. And when we talk about the noble Bereans, that's what we're talking about. We're referring to them uh, because they were searching the scriptures. But yet the Jews from other towns that came back, they agitated crowds against Paul. And when that happened, they, then Paul had to leave Berea. Now, both uh, Timothy, at that time Timothy's with them, Timothy and Silas, they stay there at Berea and they send Paul on his way. And Paul goes to Athens. The next place he goes to is Athens. Okay? While Paul was walking through Athens, you all know Athens. It's the place, it's the place with the Greek Parthenon. It's the place with all the, uh, all the Roman, uh, the Greek gods and all that. It's the capital of that stuff, right? But Paul's in there. Of course, he goes to the synagogue like always. But as he was walking through Athens, he sees all these gods and goddesses. And he's provoked. He sees the idolatry of the city. He's provoked. His heart's broken. And he speaks in the marketplace every day. And as he's preaching about Jesus in the marketplace, there's a group of people from what is called the Areopagus, Mars Hill. The Areopagus was a place of philosophers. They'd sit around and share their latest ideas. They would scratch their belly and listen, you know, kind of like Facebook, right? Facebook or whatever we have today. People are sharing their ideas there at the Areopagus, Mars Hill. And they hear about Paul, and, oh, we want to hear this new idea. So Paul preaches a message to them. We're going to look at that message here pretty soon. Um, but some of them believed at that, at that when Paul preached. And this is a total, this is not Jewish, this is a total Greek Gentile unchurched, uh, non-churched uh, background these people have. This, they have no reference for, for the God of the Bible. These are all pagans. And that's why I think it's so interesting about this. Because Paul is preaching to an audience that doesn't have much a reference. How do you talk to people who do not have a religious background at all, but yet have a pagan background? Some of them believe, but many dismiss me talk about the resurrection from the dead. So I want you to see a couple of places out of Paul's message. I want, to sh I want you to see what he does. And this is what we can do when we face people who, who have no reference. It seems like they're not from a church background. They don't know anything about, about Christianity. They don't know anything. But in the first part of this message, Paul, Paul works on the commonality. that We all have God in common. Let me read that. In Acts 17, verse 24 through 27. He says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. 
Now, as he preaches to the Gentiles, these people who are pagans, he's telling them that there's one God. God, he is your God as well as my God. He is one creator of heaven and earth. He made you and he made all of the nations. He created everyone, all of mankind. And he's given all of mankind the, the boundaries of the nations, where they are. He's done all of this. So what Paul is telling him, this, this God, he is, is our God. It's, he, we share the same God. We share this one. So he begins to tie in that to them. And every single human being on the face of the earth has the same creator, has the same one. No matter who you are, no matter what race you're from, no matter where you're, what, you're, what you think, you have the same creator. And he says there that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet actually, not far from each one of them. Every, every culture, every tribe has a heart for God. They seek after God. They might be, they might be not perfectly correct, but there is a hunger for God. Why? Because God created man for worship. God created man so he can have a relationship with man. And when man is away from him, man wants to know about their creator. The creation wants to know their creator. So he, he, he begins with that, and then he goes on. He shares the second part of that, second half, verse 29 through 31. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked... But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And he shared with them about Jesus, but he's saying judgment day is coming. This God is going to judge all of us. This God is not something that you can make with your hands. We all are going to give an account to this God. And said those times God over God overlooked at those times of ignorance. But God is calling everyone to repent from that. Everywhere. Repent from those things to seek the one and true God. And that's what Paul said. He's bringing that to them to the Athenians there at Mars Hill. Sharing with them for, about their common about their desire to want to, to, to want to know about a God. And then he begins to fill that in, say, this is Jesus Christ who's raised from the dead, is your God, and you need to worship him. And you'll be judged by him. You'll be judged by him. So that was the, that's the gospel message, that a Jew preaches the, to a bunch of non-Jews. And I think that's kind of interesting, how we can even share to a bunch of people who don't have any idea, we begin with the commonality that we're all his creation. And then we, can, then we move into the judgment that God's going to hold us accountable. He calls us to repent of our sin and place our faith in Jesus. Okay, so after, after he preaches that method, message, there's some who believe the gospel and some who do not. And he does talk to those who do believe, and but many just dismiss it. He talks about resurrection. They don't want to hear it. Okay. Then he moves on to the, the, the next place is Corinth. We're almost to the end of his journey. Corinth. While he was at Corinth, he found a couple named Aquila and Priscilla. They were tent makers. And Paul was a tent maker. He was bivocational. He worked a job while doing his ministry. And Aquila and Priscilla. So he started working with them, started staying with them, hanging around with them. And before long, Aquila and Priscilla came to faith in Christ. Paul led them to Christ. And they actually became very, very strong partners with Paul in sharing the gospel in other areas. And he had the same pattern, went to the synagogue, re reasoned that Jesus was the Christ to both the Jews and the Greeks. The Jews rejected, and, and at that moment, Paul shook off his clothes, said, uh, I'm going to the Gentiles. You guys have already judged yourself unworthy of this. But then Paul received the vision from God while he was at Corinth, encouraging him in his work. 
And there's times when God gives us visions. God will share with us things, encouragement in the right moment and the right time when we look for it. He doesn't give me, he gives us encouragement for the moment. He knows when we're worn out and, and weary. And if we, if, we, if we keep ourselves alert to see what God does to encourage us, it could be something really small, something really simple. But be, be, a, be alert to that. It could be a phone call from somebody out of the blue. It could be just something. But be alert to how God might encourage you. Sometimes God does give us a vision. He speaks to us directly to encourage us. And what basically he told me, he says, Be encouraged, Paul. I have many people in this city that have yet to call upon me. Stay with it. Don't give up. So he stayed there at least one year and six months. That's so probably the longest up to that time that Paul stayed in a town while on his missionary journey. And so Paul starts to head back. And on his way back, he goes through Ephesus. And Ephesus is in Asia. Doesn't stay very long there, because that's the area that the Spirit didn't want him to go into yet. So Ephesus, he's there for a short time. Priscilla and Aquila go with him. And the Ephesians, while he shares with them, the Jews, they ask him to stay longer, but he has to move on. He promises to return if the Lord wills. And so then from Ephesus, he goes back to Antioch. He's back home, back at Antioch. So that's his missionary journey. So that is the full, the second missionary journey. We had just covered three chapters. Man, you guys are really good staying with that. Really good. <laughs> God calls us to journey out in the, in the glory of his name. God will call us to do different things. And when we, when we start to walk in obedience with what God does, that's when we begin to experience His power. Now, I want you to also notice it's, it's dangerous. When Paul went and did and obeyed God, he was thrown in jail, he was beaten. <laughs> but you know what? When, in those times, in those times when that happened, Paul experienced the power of God like you wouldn't believe. I've been reading a, tr a lot of church history lately. And as I read down through history, I've seen people have done some, it made some incredible sacrifices that would blow your mind. Like, I don't know if I could do that. And they, when they do that, sac make that sacrifice, and they would step out, and they would either be persecuted, or they, they sold everything, or did something for somebody else that cost them a great deal. It, it was amazing how when they did that, God did something miraculous beyond what they can imagine or think and sometimes we want to see God do some things in our lives but I tell you I don't know about you but for me I want to see God do some things in my life but I want to be safe doing it <laughs> and I know that oftentimes God doesn't lead us to safe areas sometimes sometimes he's got a sometimes we walk through the valley of that shadow of death and we see Jesus, he's with us, and his rod and staff, they comfort us. But we see all this stuff going on around about us and scaring us half out of our mind. But we have to look to Jesus. We look, have to look to him. We have to look to him to, to bring us courage and boldness. I don't know what God might be calling you to. I read a statement uh, just yesterday. And it, really, it really struck to me. Somebody mentioned, you will experience God as much as you surrender to Him. Your level, our level of experiencing God is based on how much we let Him work in our life, as much as our surrender to Him. And I think about that. You know, that's true. I mean, we can let, I mean, we can let God do quite a bit. We surrender quite a bit, but, the, but there's that limit. We have that limit. We, we only go so far letting God do certain things in our life or giving up certain things so he can do certain things. And I can think it's a challenge when we think about these missionary journeys, not only missionary journeys, but even the situation of the churches back then and even in our times. What would God, what, what is God holding out for us to, to step out to that we know would require us 
to let go of something in order to hold on to something that's even greater in our life. What's God calling us to? What's he encouraging us to? Well, I'll tell you what. I, I tell people this all the time. One of the scariest, most scariest people I know is Jesus. <laughs> you don't, because uh, he's the very one who would say, I dare you. I dare you. And he said, man, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. But it's scary sometimes, but at the same time, when you're walking with him and he's got a hold of you, you're in the safest place possible when he's holding you through that storm, through that valley, through that challenge, through that water, you know. Let's pray.